this is uh, Think Tech Hawaii, and, and we're going to talk to Crystal, Crystal Kwok, who has been a, a tremendous host on Think Tech. This is about a, a movie that uh, she made. It's a very important discussion in our time. The Chinese experience is different in different places across the country. And it's uh, certainly different in a black neighborhood in Augusta, Georgia. And it's different when you talk to different generations. Crystal's grandmother grew up in Georgia. Uh, Crystal grew up on the, on the West Coast. She became a celebrity in Hong Kong, met her husband there, and spent some quality time with their kids in, in, in Hong Kong. And then they came to Hawaii after a stint as a very popular, if not provocatively popular, think tech host. Uh, she took a graduate degree at UH Manoa, just finished a doctorate in performance studies. I'm going to ask her what that is. She joins us today to tell us about a film she's made, a documentary, Blurring the Color Line, uh, which is to be shown later in May, May 25th, on America Reframed, the World Channel. In that film, we learn about um, life in Augusta, her grandmother's grocery store there. We hear about the connection between the grocery store and the surrounding Black community in Augusta. We find out why Crystal made this, this film the lessons and messages uh, she hopes to share with us about it. Maybe we'll also find out what her next film might be. Welcome to the show, Crystal. It's so wonderful to have you here. It's been a long hiatus, and now we're here again. So I'm so excited. You know, you weren't kidding. You went to UH to take a doctorate, and you took a doctorate. Why not? Why uh, not? When you have nothing to do in Hawaii, just go and get a doctorate. <laughs> And you did it. I mean, I think in record time, too. It was only a few years Six ago. Six years. That is not record uh, time. No, that's that's way more time. painful than having three babies. <laughs> so, so tell me, tell me, what, what was it like at UH Manoa? How was uh, um, performance uh, studies? How, how did that go? What is it? I'm going to put it in a nutshell. Performance studies is basically kind of a, like cultural studies, but it's like using theatrical uh terms like you know the roles we play and and performance language to talk about how the how things become how things become like you know look at the politics how the staging of like the political riots at the capitol it's very performative so that's i think you would get it in that term performance studies is really kind of a study of how things come to be and so i use that lens to do my film my film was part of my dissertation and um i i kind of interrogate how a documentary performs, you know, there are a lot of po politics of framing, right, Jay, even like right here, like what what's cut out? What what, what do we keep in? Um, so it's really kind of examining the politics of, of how we choose to select what gets kept in and what's not. So historically, there's a lot of stuff that's not in what we think we know based on history. So my film, speaking to my film about my grandmother growing up in the south in augusta georgia during jim crow is that was not recorded in history so nobody thinks oh what there were asians in in the south that back then you know so i had to dig into a lot of information to really kind of um unveil these secrets and why they were kind of silenced why why were there no histories about us back then you know we've been in the states for many many years and it's very kind of reductive our history so that's part of my process in doing this film a couple of thoughts about that number one is um you know performances are everywhere i always thought lawyers for example would go to court and perform in front of a jury Absolutely. or a judge they better get their act together, literally act. Another thing I want to tell you about performance about, it, about lawyers is there's the front, right? There's the outside, the, 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 the lens that you want people to see, that mask. Then you've got stuff behind that you don't show people, but what you're really thinking, right? So there's a lot of performance in every career. As, especially politics these days. How did your grandmother get from China to Augusta? It was actually her mother. So it was my great-grandmother who went from China um, and then they went to, you know, the whole immigration flood to San Francisco uh -huh. in the early 1900s. So it was in about the 20s. That's when they were in San Francisco. But they actually uprooted from San Francisco to Georgia because at that time there were opportunities. You know, after slavery, the plantation uh, life kind of died out. And, you know, white people didn't want to do business with black people, to be honest. And so they had this niche market. The Chinese, of course, being opportunists go, oh, OK, I'll go. You know, I don't mind. 
So they opened up stores right in the smack in the middle of the black neighborhoods. And many of them came, you know, they brought their uncles and aunts and sisters and brothers and everyone. So there was a very robust Chinese community in this small town of Augusta. Before the Masters was famous, Augusta had a lot of Chinese we didn't know about, you know, and they had grocery stores like on every block. It was crazy. <laughs> Seriously, like and, and, and these were not Chinese grocery stores in terms of, of the food, right? Right. Yeah. To that point, my great grandmother, of course, being kind of business minded, also uh, bought Chinese products in when they, you know, ordered their food. So like soy sauce and rice and all that. She would do a side business and sell that to the Chinese community who were there already. So in the film, which is opening May 25th, I can hardly wait to see it. Gee, it has a lot of awards to it, Crystal. Uh, <laughs> don't be too modest about this. This is an award-winning film. Um, you, you, you covered this. Now, how did you cover it? Uh, did you go there? Did you go there with your camera and a microphone? Oh, yeah. This took oh, me five years to make this film. Um, oh, okay. I went there several times over the last few years. And then, of course, COVID hit. And so the last two years of my um, uh, production, I had to find creative ways to put it together. And thus, when you see the film, there are a lot of animated sequences. So I used animation to kind of um, draw the past to life and to kind of fill in the visuals because nobody wants to see a bunch of talking heads the whole time, right? Um, as much as think tech is wonderful to talk like this uh, for, for historical purposes, it's really nice to be able to flesh out things that we didn't have. You know, we don't have enough archival photos. So how do we bring to life? And I'm really interested in intimate histories. Let me just distinguish that, Jay, because a lot of times history, um, a lot of old historical documentaries tend to be from top down. It's all those dry, boring photos with that kind of boring narrative. I don't do that. You know my style. I don't do that. I rather <laughs> find out about their secret dates and how they kind of snuck out and defied their family structures. But through those stories, I really strongly believe that those tell a deeper history. They reveal a much more interesting history that we don't learn in history books, right? But let's take a look at some of the photos that you have. Very uh, important um, image. It, and it was not my family. It was a community member. But this established the relationship between the Chinese and Black community. A lot of times the Chinese storekeeper would hire um, black errand boys, or, you know, they would help out at the store. But just think of, look at this framing, talking about politics of framing. The, the black boys were sitting in the back, right? And the store creepers were in front. I think it's very performative. It's very revealing of the, the, the uh, relationship at the time. Let's see another one. I'm not sure. I don't have any many um, archival photos because it was very limited. Uh, we saw that one already. That's my grandmother on the left and her oldest sister on the right. Um, again, that was just really the time was kind of so special, well, right? Can you give us a year on that, Crystal. Uh, probably late thir late thirties, because she mm -hmm. ran away in nineteen thirty nine. Oh, what a so story! So she was probably about sixteen there. Yeah, but they were so dressed. So this is my aunt Lorraine, who was one of the youngest and the um, surviving sisters of the Lum family, and I had visited her to ask her the stories about her life, dating and sneaking out and understanding the hierarchy <laughs> of that time. And she was so, oh my God, when you hear her voice, you'll be like, what? These crazy Southern accents from these Chinese looking people. What's, <laughs> what's that all about? They spoke Cantonese. So from uh -huh. Hong Kong, they learned their parents made them speak Chinese, but that was Cantonese. Yes. So they had to learn how to write and read Chinese. Yeah, on the side. That was part of their um, self-isolating life. So there was one grocery store left in the whole um, neighborhood and I went to visit it. And this was one of the regular customers there. And I had a nice conversation with him. It was kind of funny. I brought my uh, my uncle in at that time and he spoke to him and goes, oh, do you remember so-and-so? Yeah, I remember him. So there was this really interesting, um, enduring relationship between the storekeepers and their customers back in the days. They really had a relationship. You know, um, as much as they self-isolated, I think that there was some genuine kind of um, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say friendships because I don't think it was really equal. There was a power dynamics, right? The Chinese were still the storekeepers. And I think the black neighbors recognize that they know like they needed each other. But still, there was a little bit of a power play, yeah. which makes the tension. But um, a little bit, because that you know, speaking to today's tensions, it goes back to that. Why did the Asians kind of slip into this place that was 
uh, right? Um, white adjacent, like I said, and they were never considered black. And how did that play out to make, create these tensions between the two communities? But the tension between the blacks and the Chinese was not nearly as great as the tension between um, the whites and the black. And well, I guess yeah. the question is, how much tension was there between the Chinese and the whites? Yeah, well, that's a subtle one, right? Because uh, in my family, they were allowed to go to white schools. So they live in the black neighborhood. They would travel outside to go to white schools and they come back and live in the black neighborhood, which says it all, um, that they were accepted, but they were not completely accepted, right? And there's a scene that's very troubling in the film where I interview these um, white churchgoers and I ask them how they felt about the Chinese living and growing up in, you know, in this kind of obscure space. And she would say, oh, we just love them. You know, they're just wonderful. We still love them today. And, you know, by saying that, they're basically saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're great. Not like who? The others. So they other the black community. Right. You don't realize when they when they say that. They're actually saying, yeah, oh, yeah, the Chinese were OK. We tick them in, but we don't take black people in. So Big question. We, uh, are these Chinese families still there? Yes. Uh, so there are quite a few. Yeah. yeah, some were. A lot of them moved to San Francisco to move back out there where they married out. But there is still, um, you know, a, a handful of them who are still there. Uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. So when you went back, you actually interviewed people with a camera and the movie has these clips of interviews oh, yeah. you made with oh, oh i have to see it i have to see oh, it oh no lots of precious material that is not archived from before and it also it complicates the narrative we know the history is a very black and white narrative we always think of the black and white tensions but we don't think about you know through and, and it's on america reframed on the world channel which i think america reframed says it all. We're, we're reframing. I'm trying to reframe things. How do we look at things from an Asian American perspective into this whole kind of racial history that we're, our country's built off, right? You know, it, there are a lot of subtle problematic placements of people because of this white power that created this central power, and we all had to play our roles in it. Reframed, reframed is such an interesting term. How, what do you take that to mean? In this context, America reframed. I think it means to disrupt dominant narratives, is to bring voice to stories that aren't normally heard. So why are they untold? Why are they silenced in history? I'm a big, you know me, I'm like a big feminist speaker. So I reframe my lens based on a woman's perspective. So I gave more privilege to like the women's stories. I intentionally did that, right? Because they're historically been silenced. Nobody cares to ask these old ladies what their life was like when they were young, but they loved to talk about their past. And what does that reveal about the past through their stories, through their oral histories, right? So yeah. I think it's fascinating to reframe history through the Chinese American lens. And through your lens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's through my lens. Actually, it is a big part of it is my journey. It's not so much an outsider's view. It's me not growing up in the South, but trying to understand these racial tensions. What an education that must have been for you. I mean, it's not only that you knew something was out there that could be needed to be reframed, that there was, um, you know, a, a dynamic yeah. over color yeah. in this in this aspect of the South. But you went there, you touched it, you felt it, you asked about it. You must have learned a lot. What did you learn? Okay, well, I don't want to spoil the film, but I do have to say, so spoiler alert for anybody who wants to like watch it all surprising. But in my process, the biggest um, surprise was the, the fact that I have black cousins. Ah. I went you met to- them. You met them. I went to Mississippi to find them because nobody talked about them with me growing up. Nobody mentioned this one aunt of mine who married a black man from Mississippi. And again, you know how it is with Asians. They like put everything under the rug. Anything that they think is like shameful, you don't talk about it. <laughs> so it really um, like I had to dig deep and I found them. And there, I have these wonderful cousins that I now keep in touch with. And my daughter managed to see her and meet her and her kids. And so they're all part of the film. So I look forward to everyone having a chance to, to see this unfold. Uh, what about we should uh, take a look at the trailer now? Yes, if we can. That would be great. Should we do that now? Yep. Okay. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Yeah. In the segregated South, buses were separated, black people in the back, white in the front. Where do you think the Asians sat? 
my grandma Pearl. She moved with her family to Augusta, Georgia in 1927, where they ran a grocery store in the black neighborhood. What did it mean to grow up Chinese in a black and white space? Now, when I was growing up, the expression, we had a Chinese grocery store in every corner. You know, the laws at that time were so limited, but not applying to, to the Chinese. Segregation was nothing more than a pseudo way of carrying on slavery. How did they end up in the black neighborhood? They are still people of color. You can only go so high. And at school, they were mostly white kids. Did you feel? All, did you all feel? White, all white kids. They How did that no make you feel? No mingling at all. The Chinese, you know, there's some of them that they don't want nothing to do with the blacks, but they yet they want their money, you know. They play the blacks against the Chinese, like the Chinese were a little better than the blacks, and the whites was a little better than the Chinese. That's the way it went. Black people in Augusta are tired of being told that there is no racial problem here. Well, now the nation knows that Augusta has a problem. The whole city was burned. They target the Chinese stores and what? the white businesses. Well, you know, during the riot, those that got burned down are the ones that didn't treat the blacks good. How are we going to move forward if we don't address the past? Yeah, blurringthecolorline.com. I was going to ask you, it's funny that we should come together on this. I was going to ask you whether you were making a political statement in this film. <laughs> this is race is a big political issue. Race in the South, big political issue. But you told me during, during the break, there were race riots in what, Augusta? Yes, um, it was a huge it, one in 1970. Well, I don't like politics, you're right, Jay. And I didn't want to go there. I really didn't. But as I was making this film, it went from personal to political, as things do. Because, of course, Black Lives Matter happens during the process of my making of the film. And so it kind of, I felt compelled to address this. Like, how does my story about the Chinese in the segregated South speak to these tensions we have today? And shortly after the Black Lives Matter movement, we had the um, anti-Asian hate violence, all within this very similar time when I was trying to weave the film together. And so they were all all relevant because I'm dealing with Black history. I'm dealing with Asian American immigrant history. I'm dealing with anti-Blackness and also the tensions between the two communities. And so it 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 had to be political in a sense because if we look at history, we really kind of get a deeper look at wow, maybe a little bit of this tension has to do with our past and how we played our roles towards this white power and why so many Black people feel like Asian people don't like them, or why we have these fears that we have these perpetuating narratives, right? Asians um, are, the, are very racist ourselves, I want to first to say that. And we have these uncomfortable narratives that really perpetuate that anti-Black racism, which was bothering me, and I needed to address that. It's like, why, why, do, why do Asians look down on Black people, right? And, 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 and how does that affect the anti-Asian violence? It's just like there are so many things. And the violence wasn't um, by the black community. It was by the white community also. But media turns it into something that's Afro-Asian. And um, speaking to the riots, it's a it's a really crucial moment that um, really had a showdown because the Chinese stores were all throughout the black neighborhood. So when they had this huge riot and they came in and, you know, like the LA riots and all the other big ones, they went and destroyed all the stores, right? In LA, it was the Korean stores, but in the in Augusta, Chinese, same thing. They mm -hmm. tried to destroy all of them. But I found two families where they had such in honest and, and wonderful relationships with their black neighbors that, that the black rioters did not touch their stores. So they went around it. So it, it shows relationships matter. You know, what you do, what goes around comes around. If you're going to treat your neighbor um, like an enemy, they're going to come back to you, right? If you treat them like a human being, they're going to respect you back. And I feel like we have these issues today. We keep creating these kind of like anti anything to keep our, in our own safe space. And it's very problematic because we don't care to learn each other's histories. We just keep to ourselves and perpetuate those narratives. So I, I felt like a bigger part of my film had to address 
anti-blackness, um, especially from the Asian side, because I saw it in my family. I saw these kind of derogatory ways of looking at the black community and I needed to address that. And so I think it's an important conversation today. Um, and, and also there are wonderful relationships between the two communities. So it's, it's nuanced, right? It's complicated. It's not one thing or the other. So we need to kind of look at all the different little elements that kind of bring this complexities to life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a, a new way of looking at it or a, an, an element that we really haven't heard in the media. And I, and I don't know if there's any literature on it. You know, you are, you are breaking ground here, actually, Crystal. Yeah, a breaking barrier. I really do feel that. It was so hard to do my research when I was doing my dissertation because there hasn't been much written up about it. Um, there are a few, you know, a handful of things, but people don't think about resituating the lens again. You know, we're so consumed with the larger structures that tell us how to think about things that we need to look outside of it. Yeah, about community. I use this one term, Jay, if I may, um, yeah. cross-pollinating. I think it's a really important term because you know, in, in the life, especially in Hawaii, we are all cross-pollinating, right? We're all a mixture of different things. We're not just like pure Chinese, pure Hawaiian, pure white. There's this mix, but we thrive with that mix. We're entangled in this messiness that's really creates wonderful human beings. And we should embrace that. <laughs> wow. This is really important, I tell you. I was just going to say that poster, that tiny little girl there, um, she was in Augusta when I went to screen it a couple of months ago. And Deanna Brown, who is James Brown's daughter, she was a panelist with me to discuss um, the past because James Brown was an errand boy at one of the Chinese grocery stores. And she met that lady, Dorothy, little Dorothy, and she was like emotionally entranced because it connected her father to her by seeing this like lady, Dorothy, who had that store where James Brown had helped do groceries back in the days i mean talk about connective histories you know it's really quite wonderful to see the connections sometimes. yeah when you think when you think of a, a community a neighborhood yeah um, the grocery store is kind of the center it's where people meet each other where they transact yeah. their you know transactions that are critically important to their life at home yeah. And, and so um, it becomes a, a, a meeting place, a gathering place. I'm so glad you said that because I want to end with that. Going back to the performance studies that you asked me in the beginning is I feel like the grocery store was a Jim Crow stage. If we're going to use theatrical terms, it was a stage. The foundation was white supremacy. But the actors in my film were black and Chinese. They have the voices. They are the main characters in my play. And it's the entanglement of their encounters. They're both wonderful and tense encounters, but mostly wonderful back then. They really had, they didn't have issues like they do now, not like those kind of violences. So a lot of them had really wonderful stories to share. And I hope you all have a chance to watch it um, when it comes out on PBS. PBS platforms, including YouTube, it's going to be streaming on the American Reframe series on the World Channel um, starting May 25th. So I think it's national. And so hopefully everybody will get a chance to watch it. It's going to be streaming for free for about a month. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see if we get any good feedback. Well, I'd like to I'd like to put the, you know, the poster and some uh, you know publicity on, on ThinkTech about it and the thought that people here in Hawaii uh, would love to know about this, would want to know about this. So. I think racial history is really important to talk about, Jay, and it applies to Hawaii, too. But think about the colonial history we have here, the race relations and tensions here. It's all kind of relevant to think about how we come together and talk power struggles and hierarchies in these spaces. Yeah, diversity is a big problem, but it's the strongest strength. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Contaminated diversity. That's what I learned in school. I love that term. So this must motivate you. You've been you know, truly successful in this movie. Um, and I, I just wonder if you have thoughts about the next one based on you know, something in your life or something in the community. Well, you're going to love this, Jay, because one of the um, inspirations of my next project had to do with a show that I did on your show years ago is on the Honolulu prostitution. Remember that one? I it's one like of our most popular shows of all time, by the way. Maybe we should show it again because <laughs> there's a lot we don't know about about that era. And of course, I'm going to take my female lens into that world and think about what it was like, you know, in that era to be in the brothel industry when it was regulated and, and legalized, right? It was a great show. It really was and still is. Uh, it has an enormous number of views to it, and it's a great idea to do more of it. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. 
And I'm delighted with all the things you've done and are doing. Well, thank you for the space, Jay. Really appreciate it. And I always enjoy talking to you. So we'll do more. Crystal Quark, filmmaker, doctor. Um, I'm going to call her Dr. Crystal Quark from now on. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Jay. (laughs) Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.